And I'm glad you're here as, as we're talking about this faith and as we're talking about uh, how we step out in daring faith. We've been learning for the last nine weeks these, these three key things that have come up time and time again that, that, that I want us to remind us of today. We have learned that if you want to have the blessing of God on your life, if you want to have the power of God in your life, if you want to have the anointing of God flowing through your life, then these three things we've learned about need to be present in your life each and every day. And that's integrity, humility, and generosity. they get got to be there. And today, since this is the day that we're celebrating, as we've said already, Mother's Day, and, and mothers are so generous with their time and so much sacrifice, and also because this is the day we've been asking you to be praying for, to be, be stepping up, and, and, and later on after I get done preaching, we're going to take up a special offering and ask. You should have received a commitment card when you came in. If not, you can get one as we go on here. And that uh, to make a 36-month commitment to help us pay down the debt. So because of that, and today I want to talk about, I don't have enough time to talk about integrity, humility, and generosity. So I want to focus on generosity today. When we look through the scriptures, the scriptures tell us time and time again that there's promises after promises, almost 7,000 promises in the Bible that's recorded. And these promises, with every promise, there's a premise that says simply, you know, if you do this, if you will go do this with your life, if you'll say these things and do these things, God promises to be there and to help us out and do these things within our life. And when it comes to generosity, there are more promises related to generosity than there are any other subject within the scriptures. And when I say generosity, I'm not just talking about our money. I'm talking about being generous with your time, being generous with your energy, with your talent, being generous with every aspect, everything that God has given you. And as we do that, you might ask, so what is generosity? Why is God so interested in generosity? Why is he so interested in us learning how to become the most generous people, if we call ourselves Christians, that this world has ever seen? And the answer is simply because of this. Generosity is love in action. How many times have you heard me say this? You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. You cannot be loving without being generous. If I tell my wife that I love her, you know, and I don't give myself to her, I really don't. If I tell my kids that I love them and I'm not giving myself to my family, I really don't uh, love them when it comes to that, you know, uh, because love gives. Remember, God so loved the world that he what? that he gave, you know, uh, when it comes to that. It, it's interesting. I, I read a study of the major words, the key words that you find in the Bible, like the word believe. It's important for us to believe, isn't it? Some 272 times we see the word we're challenged to believe within scriptures. The word prayer talks about teaching us how to pray, why to pray. It's important for us to pray. 371 times that's found within scripture. The word love it's extremely important for us to know how to love, why we should love, and all of that. And it's found some 714 times in the Bible. But the word give, the challenge is about being generous, is found some 2,152 times. Why? God is a giver. It's God is a giver. If God was not generous, we would not have everything that we have. We've learned this. Everything that we are, it's because we have a God that loves us and a God that gave. And God wants us to be like him. That's why he sent us his son to say, look it, I'm going to send my son to be the example of how you are to live your life, every aspect of your life. And again, since today we're, we're going to take up and we're going to challenge you, we've been challenging you and encourage you, especially in the financial aspect of it, I just want to look at, at 12 things about generous. You know, 12 major promises when it comes to, to generosity. There's a lot more, but these are 12 things. Some of them I don't think are going to be new to you. Some of them I think are, or most of them I believe are going to be, oh yeah. But, but they're things that I think sometimes we forget and we need to remind ourselves. And I hope you're taking no notes. I want to strongly challenge you today because I am giving you 12 things and I don't expect you to remember half of them within an hour with them done. So if we want to be like God, we want to be like his son, we want to be generous, if we walk away and forget this, it's going to be tough for us. So I want to encourage you to take these because I'm always challenging to evaluate. So take and take these notes. I'm going to fly through it pretty fast because like I said, I don't think any of this is going to be earth shattering for you here this morning, but it's going to be powerful reminders for us about why generosity is so important to us in our lives. And, and we can take that home and we can study, we can understand. So let's dive into it. Generosity. The first thing we need to remember is generosity honors God. Generosity honors God. It, it's an act of worship. It's recognizing that everything that we have is a gift from God. In 2 Corinthians 9, it says this, you will be glorifying God through your generous gifts, which we're going to be doing at the end of this message. Your generosity will prove that you are obedient to the good news of Christ. And Proverbs 12.31 says, 
Whoever is generous to the needy, it honors God. So we're worshiping God. We're honoring God when we step up in daring faith, when we step out in daring faith, and we become generous with the things that God has given us. But also, generosity, it draws us closer to God, the second thing. How does generosity draw us closer to God? I mean, think about this. It does that because whatever I invest in, I'm interested in that. If I, if I invest my time in something, if I invest my money in something, if I invest my energy in something, whatever it is, a job, uh, a hobby, whatever I invest my time and money in, that's going to be important to me, and I'm going to pay attention to that. So I'm going to be drawn close to that. So when I invest in God and his work, not only does it honor God, but it draws me closer to him. Proverbs 14.23 says, The purpose of tithing, which we just did a few minutes ago, the purpose of tithing is to teach you, to teach us, to always put God first in our lives. See, we give the first part of our income, that first 10%, that's what tithe means, on the first day of the week. We say, God, you're really number one. It all came from you, and you just asked us a little bit, so I give back to you. Jesus said in Matthew 6, your heart will be wherever your treasure is. So as I give, as I invest, and not only does it honor God, but it draws me closer to him. And then the third thing that generosity do, because I'm honoring him and drawing me closer to God, it makes me then more like his son, Jesus. The most generous person to walk the face of this earth, of course, was Jesus Christ, because he laid down his life for everybody. And the Bible says we have been saved because of the generosity of Jesus. Every time you give your time, your money, your energy, anything, you become more like Christ. Proverbs 21, 26 says, the greedy always want more, but the godly love to give. And the more godly you become, the more generous you are. And it also works in reverse. The more generous you are, the more godly you become. Luke eleven forty one 41 says, Purity is best demonstrated by generosity. In other words, to live a holy life, it's to be a giver. It makes me like Jesus. It helps me understand Jesus. I remember once at a conference, there was a guy that was up speaking and everything, and he gave this testimony about how uh, one day he was coming home, him and his little boy was out, he had him in his back seat, in his car seat, and as they were driving home, he decided to surprise his little boy and drive through McDonald's and get him some fries. So he went through and got him some fries, and he handed them back to him, and they were driving, got back on the road driving, and all of a sudden, if you've ever done this, you know, the aroma of the french fries started to come up front to him. And so the dad was like, that smell kind of good. So he decided to reach his hand back, and he said, hey, buddy, can I have a fry? And he said his little boy grabbed his arms around those french fries, and he looked at him and says, no, daddy, these are mine. And the man, just for a second, he said, immediately I had three thoughts go through my mind. Number one, he realized that his child had forgotten that his father is the source of all fries in his life. I mean, think about that. He would have no french fries if it weren't for him. He brought them there, he drove up, he ordered them, he paid for them, he got them, and then he handed it to him. If it wasn't for his father, he would have no fries. And the second thing he realized is that his child doesn't realize that he could take all those fries from him immediately. Yes, he did all that, and he handed it to him, but he could reach back and say, you know what, buddy, that's enough. You're going to ruin your supper. You can't have any more. Or on the other hand, he could go back, and he could buy his son a truckload of fries. He could take one and go back and buy him 10 more fries when it comes to that. His father was totally in charge, and he said the third thing he realized that he really didn't need his fries. If he wanted his fries, if he could have bought some for himself. He just wanted his son to learn unselfishness. He wanted him to learn how to share. And my friends, that's the same three reasons that God wants us to learn generosity that we're talking about this morning. God doesn't need our money. I mean, it all belongs to him anyway, that. It wasn't yours before you were born. It won't be yours after you're dead. He just said, while you're on this side of eternity, I'm going to give you these things, and I want you to learn to share. I want you to learn to be step out in daring faith and be extremely generous with these things. If you'll let me stay with the metaphor, he's the source of all our fries, everything we have in our life. If God didn't love us and be generous with us, we wouldn't have anything. God can take everything we have away instantly, or he can turn around and he can bless us, as we've learned through this series, a hundredfold. Why? Because God is a fry giver. <laughs> God is generous, and when I step out and do that and learn to be the same, it makes me more like his son Christ. But fourthly, it's the cure for materialism, generosity. When we learn how to step out in daring faith and be generous, it is the cure for materialism. And you, because think about this, what is materialism? It's all about getting. 
get, 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 and the more I get, the more I have, the more I want, and it's just about getting. The only, and I can't stress that word only, the only antidote to materialism is giving, you know? And you might be sitting there and think, well, Dave, I'm, I'm not materialistic. But the Bible, if we were to do a study on this, the Bible would say, yeah, if you're not generous, then you are materialistic. If you're not being in giving like I am, if you're not following the example of my son, then yeah, you are in that. It says in, in Matthew 6, 24, you cannot serve both God and money. And the key word there, of course, is cannot. It didn't say you should not serve both God and money. It says you can't. It's impossible. Basically, it's a simple teaching to us that we have to choose. What's more important? Is, is God more important in serving God and living and sacrificing for God? Or is it my money? I can't have two gods. And that's extremely, I mean, ten fingers pointed here. That is extremely difficult in this consumer-driven culture that we live in today in that. I mean, I think we all could agree on that. It's very easy to get caught up in, in being a consumer and thinking that my life, that my net worth determines my self-worth, but it doesn't. You know, your values are not determined by your valuables in that. But we are daily bombarded by advertising. You know, you got these apps, you got your iPhone, you got whatever you turn on the TV, and they're constantly just telling you, here's the neatest, greatest thing. You know, you can't live without it, and we believe that. You know, we believe we need to have this within our life. And 1 Timothy 6, starting verse 17, reminds us, it says this, command those who are rich, and I want to stop right there. Command those who are rich. A lot of the times when we read this, we go through this, the first thing you'd say, yeah, we need to command people like Bill Gates. Those rich people need to learn how to sacrifice. If they would just step up and give, command those that are rich is speaking to every single one of us in this room. It's speaking to everybody that lives in America. Probably one of the best sermons that I heard on this was done by John Reeside when he was here, when he preached for us one Sunday, talking about this and reminding us and challenges. Remember, I don't know if you were here, he went through our wardrobe. And he said, you know, how much is, you got a watch, your shirt, your shoes, and, and the money that was put on there put us in the top 95% of the, or top 5% of the richest people in the world just by the clothes we have on us right now, by the money we paid for our clothes not including the money we have or anything else that we have. We are those that are being commanded. Command those that are rich. There are people around the world, remember? The poorest of the poor in America. There are people around the world that would love to come to be America and be the poorest of the poor in America. That's why this can be tough sometimes, but we need to pull back and remember. Command those who are rich, he says, in this present world, not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. I think we also forget the blessing of God, that he's created everything for our enjoyment. God wants us to enjoy, not endure life. That's why he is so generous. He created everything for our enjoyment. At the end, it says, command them to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will take hold of the life that is what? True life. A lot of people are living life, but not the true life. The life that God has, the life that God wants, because they don't understand the generous part. They're not stepping up and being generous. They're not stepping out in daring faith, and they're missing so much in their life. Five, generosity. Then if I'm doing that, it also demonstrates my faith. Because it shows I'm trusting in the promises we just talked about with God. Those 7,000 promises, it shows that I believe. It shows that I believe that God will take care of me if I'll step out and if I step up and obey. 2 Corinthians 9.13 says, Your giving proves the reality of your faith. And Philemon 1.6 says, You are generous because of your faith. You know? That's why... That's what, in a sense, we've been doing, and that's what we've been trying to do for the last nine weeks is help us to understand how to step out in faith, how to challenge us to build up our faith because we are generous because of our faith. If we don't have faith, we're not generous. See, stinginess, if you can allow me to say this, stinginess is caused by unbelief. I really don't believe that God can take care of me. I really don't believe that if I give this away, I'll have enough for myself. And so that's worry, that's anxiety, that's fear, that's unbelief. And stinginess causes unbelief. But you're generous because of your faith. In Malachi 3.10, God dares you to trust his promises. He says these words, bring your whole tithe to my storehouse. What's the storehouse? The temple, it's wherever you worship. Bring your whole tithe 
to my storehouse. Test me in this and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you won't have enough room for it, or you won't have room enough for it. That's God saying, I dare you to step out in faith. And by the way, this is the only place in the Bible that you can prove that you can prove there is a God. I went to Bible college, yeah, and, and I learned, you know, the philosophical arguments of the existence of God, the, you know, the cosmological argument, you know, the theological arguments, the teleological arguments, you know, and so forth, Kant's moral argument, and, and, and all those different kinds of things. But in the Bible, it says the way that you prove that God exists right here is by tithing and seeing if he doesn't bless you more than you ever thought. So it demonstrates my faith, but, but next, it, it reveals my character. Generosity reveals my character. In other words, it shows the kind of heart that I really have. Do I have a selfish heart or an unselfish heart? Do I have a generous heart or a stingy heart? Giving, generosity shows what it's like. In fact, the Bible says that God uses money to test what's really inside of us. He says he uses money to see if, if he can trust you with more. And he says if you're faithful with the little things, then I am going to give you more things. The Bible says if you're faithful with that which is not your own, the stuff that he loans us while we're here on earth, I'll give you greater blessings in eternity. Jesus said it like this in scripture. If you are untrustworthy with worldly wealth, meaning if you're untrusty with the things I give you right now, you don't manage your money well, you're not generous with it, you don't step out in daring faith with it, who will trust you with the riches of heaven? And the answer is nobody. Nobody will. So it helps me understand my true heart. But number seven, generosity, it brings God's blessing in my life. I mean, I could give you a hundred, hundred verses. It was hard to kind of start narrowing these down and chopping this away. A hundred verses on this in the Bible. But if you want God's blessing on your life, you got to learn. You got to learn simply not to be a miser, not to be stingy. You got to learn to be open-handed. Open-handed with everything that God gives you to help other people with everything that you've got. The more that you give away of your time, the more that you give away of your talent, the more that you give away of your treasure, God will give to you. Giving brings God's blessings. Proverbs 22.9 says these powerful but simple words. Generous people will be blessed. You can either believe that or you don't. But God said it. It's true. And he challenges us in Deuteronomy 15.10. Give generously. Then because of this, God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. God, I'm not preaching, you know, health and wealth type of stuff here. Now, when it comes to this, it's just showing that we can receive the blessings of God. In 2 Corinthians 9, starting in verse 7, it says, God loves the one who gives gladly, and God will make it up to you by giving you everything you need and more so that there will not be only enough for your own needs, but plenty left over to give joyfully to others. When we learn to step out in daring faith, when he challenges and we step out, when we learn to give generously, God says, not only will I provide all your needs, but I'm going to give you so much that you have the choice to whether you keep it and hoard it, but you, know, you have the choice to turn around and you can bless others richly also. It brings God's blessing but also generosity, number eight, it increases my happiness. It brings me joy. It'll bring us joy. A lot of people know this. The only people who don't know this, who don't understand the joy of the Lord, are people who don't understand generosity that we're challenged with in Scripture. Jesus said in Acts 20, there is more happiness in giving than in receiving. And of course, <laughs> this is the verse that we use a lot of times to quote to our children when it comes to Christmas time, you know, uh, and letting them know and, and understand w when it comes to that. And, and I'll admit you, when it was Christmas, when I was a child at Christmas, it was more about David and what David was getting, you know, than what I was giving to other people. I was more concerned about the amount of gifts and what the gifts were I was bringing into my life than I, were, than I was about the gifts that I was giving to other people. That was a long time ago, and I was immature, and I was self-centered, you know. But today... Now, now being a husband, now being a father at Christmas. It's not about the presents I give. It's so much more about the joy of, of what I'm, I'm able to purchase and what I'm able to give and watch my family and my friends as they open what I've been able to give to them. Why is it different? Because I grew up. Because I, I stopped being self... It's not that I still don't like to get gifts. That's not it. You know, but I'm not so self-centered with that. It stopped being about me. That, that's what the Bible calls... That's called maturity, you know? And, and sadly... Some people just don't grow up today, you know. 
They get 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, whatever. And this is mine. I worked hard. It's mine. It's mine for whatever it is. It's mine for my you know, toys. It's mine for my hobby. It's mine for whatever. It's mine. I'm going to take it and all that other kind of stuff. And, and they miss blessings upon blessings. They miss the understanding of what generosity means and the blessings of God. And they miss so much joy and happiness because they won't be generous. But another thing generosity does is it, expa- it expands our influence. The more generous you become, the more influential you can become. Basically, the more God can use you in ways you can never, ever dream. Because there's a difference between being famous in this world and being, you know, influential. There's a lot of people who are famous who have no influence whatsoever in the world. You know, but when you step up, when you step out in daring faith and you become generous with what God has given you, it's amazing the influence it can have. In Proverbs 11.24, it says, The world of the generous gets larger and larger means more and more influence. But the world of the stingy gets what? Smaller and smaller in that. And the psalmist wrote in the 112th Psalm, those who give generously to those in need will never be forgotten. They will have influence and honor. God can use you in ways you could never imagine with that, to have an influence, to, to, to be a testimony. I, um, several years ago, I heard a pastor talking about him and his wife when they first got married, you know, 45 years ago and that they decided, you know, that they were going to step up and step out in faith, and they were going to tithe 10%, even though, you know, they didn't have a grade of income, whatever. And so the first year of marriage, they did. The second year of marriage, they decided to increase that to 11%. You know, the third year of marriage, they decided to increase that to 12 the fourth to 13%, and so forth and so on. Why? They did that because they wanted their hearts to grow bigger every year and to step out in faith, and, and to become closer to God. And, and that they didn't tell anybody that they were doing this until, until as, as it continued to increase to 20, 30, 40. Today, and for the last 10 years, they give away 90% of their income and only live on 10%. And God has used them and blessed them, and that he's become an author and, and sold a lot and has some good money, and he gives away 90% of that and uses 10%. And the influence he has, this man stood before Congress defending rights of Christians with different bills and stuff like that. And one of the senators pulled him aside and said, why, why do you think God chose you? Why do you think God allowed you to have so much and to give so much and to be able to stand here with the power that you have to stand to testify? You know, n- not every Christian gets to stand before Senate like, like you do with the influence that you have and say what you do. Why do you think God chose you? And he said, well, I can only think of one thing, and it's, it's because God, I believe, has tested me over the years, as we read about in the Scripture, and he's learned that he can trust me. He's learned that, that he could trust me. As, as, as my books became more popular and more money started coming in and we started giving it, you know, he says, I didn't have to have a bigger, better house. I didn't have to have all these toys and everything. He says, I still buy my watches at Walmart. He says, I have a truck that's over 15 years old, a Ford pickup truck. I didn't have to have all this. God saw that as he gave me more, I gave more away. And you know, a lot of times people hear that and think, well, sure. <laughs> you know, if I had millions of dollars of income, I'd have no problem giving that away. And my challenge to you is, no, I believe that's a lie. Because this is how we test our heart in the, in the truth of that. How are we stepping out in generosity with what we have right now today? Because it doesn't matter if you make 10000 a year or $10 million a year. What you're giving or how you're doing it and how you're stepping out in daring faith with generosity right now, if you're making $60,000 a year, is exactly how you'll step out if you're making $6 million. Because it's a matter of the heart. It's learning to step out in faith and being blessed by God. Seeing that more come in so you give more away. And when you give more away, God gives you more than you can handle so you give more away. But unfortunately, in our mindset today is, oh, I get more. Now what can I have? I always wanted this. What can I have, you know? And this man said, so I have a 45-year track record of being generous. God knew he could trust me. And with generosity comes influence. The way God could use us in ways we could never imagine. But also with generosity, it multiplies. It multiplies our money. God has worked it out in this universe in such a way that when I give God 10% of my income, as we said today, tithing, that he makes the 90% go further than if I would have kept all 100% of my income. I don't know how he does it. That's God. But the Bible says in Proverbs 11.25, a generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. And in 2 Corinthians 9.11, it says, you will be enriched. That means when you step out in faith, trust God, give the way we're talking about. You'll have more than you have right now. You'll be enriched so that you can give even more generously. God multiplies. 
He says, play this game with me. He challenges us. God says, you give to me and I'll give to you. And you give to others and I'll keep giving to you. Let's see who out gives. And we will lose that game every time. Because the truth is, you cannot out give God. So generosity, it multiplies my money, but it also, it brings God's protection. I, I don't think we understand this when we step out of daring faith and, and, and we just give of our time, our talents, especially our finances, and, and that's there. The, the psalmist wrote in the 112th Psalm, all goes well for the generous man who conducts his business fairly. Such a man will not be overthrown by evil circumstances. Now, I want to make this clear. It does not say you will not have evil circumstances, okay? It says you will not be overthrown by them. Everybody goes through tough times. Everybody has problems in this world that we live on right now. There's no guarantee of a problem-free life, okay? We're going to have them. But when you're generous, God says, I'll make sure if you're generous, if, 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 if you're stepping out in faith, that you're not going to be blown away. You're not going to be overthrown by those evil circumstances that happen in your life. And then at the end it says, God's constant care of him will make a deep impression on all who see it. That means they'll look at you and they'll say, wow, look at Look at this person going through a tough time, yet God still blesses them in tough times. God is blessing them even when things are going wrong in his life and around. What a powerful testimony. What a powerful witness. Generosity brings God's protection. And lastly, generosity will be rewarded in heaven. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, 18 and 19, use your money to do good. And I want to stop right there because I want you to see that word use. Money is to be used. It's not to be loved. It's to be used. And if you use money, it will help you love people. But if you love money, it will cause you to use people. It's a tool. It's neither good or bad. It's neutral. You can use it for good or you can use it for bad. And I know people say all the time, but Dave, the Bible says that money is the root of all evil. No. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. You're to love people and to use money. So he says, use your money to do good, always being ready to share with others whatever God has given you. By doing this, you'll be storing up real treasure for yourself in heaven. It is the only safe invest investment for eternity. And they will be living, talking about us, and they will be living a fruitful Christian life down here as well. I used to preach you can't take it with you because you never see a, a hearse pulling a U-Haul, and then I posted this Facebook picture that somebody shared with me because, you know, it showed a hearse pulling a U-Haul. But it doesn't matter. He might take it to the grave with him, but he's not going to get it up to heaven with him when it comes to that, you know. But, but it says, you know, uh, that, that you will live a fruitful life. How do you do that? How, how do you how, do you, how are you rewarded in heaven? Five weeks ago, I talked about this. Four times in scripture, it says, Jesus said, store up for yourself treasure in heaven. Store up for yourself treasure in heaven. Store up for yourself treasure in heaven. How do you bank in heaven? By investing people in people now on this side of eternity. That's how you do it, you know? That's how you get them there. Uh, the scripture says this. I think one of the most important things Christ said in Luke 16, 9. I tell you, use your worldly resources to benefit others. See, not us, but to others. And make friends. In this way, your generosity stores up a reward for you in heaven. He's not saying go out and give your money to buy a bunch of people into church, but he says when you learn to give generously, people are going to look at you and say, why? Because the world says keep it, hoard it. It's yours. You worked hard. Don't do that. And when you give away sacrificially, when you step out in daring faith and you give away generously, they look at you and say, why? And like I said already, it gives you a chance to say, this is why, because my God provides all my needs. It gives you a reason to give a testimony to say, and they're like, wow, how do I get that? I want that. And then they step up and they receive Christ just like you, and they get to spend eternity and they get to go to heaven. See, I'm always challenging you to evaluate your walk and your life and your relationship with the messages that God speaks to us each and every week here. And here's a challenging question. Here's an evaluating question to yourself. Do you think anybody's going to be in heaven because of your generosity? Do you think when you get there, you know, that you're going to have somebody come up and tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, the reason I'm here is because that one time you gave of your time sacrificially. You gave of your gifts to teach that Sunday school class so I could hear the truth of God. You gave of your money so a building could be built or so I could go on this trip. You sacrificially gave. You said no to a vacation and gave to this or your time or your money. And because of that, I stand in eternity in heaven. Thank you. 
That's what it means, my friends, to be rewarded in heaven. And those rewards are going to last forever. See, where do you think it's best to bank your wealth? Here for 60, 70, 90 years that God gives you? Well, forever in eternity that will never run. To me, it's a no-brainer. Generosity. We're blessed by it in the ways that we see. We're blessed by it in these. And, and just, there's so many more. But in these things, I want us to understand. And, and as the worship team is going to come to lead us to this, God, I want to challenge you. I don't know where it is in your life that you need to step out and be generous. You know, but to understand this and to receive this and to take these steps, the greatest step of generosity we need to give right and to make sure that we've done is give our life over to God, to give our life to Jesus Christ, to surrender our lives to him. Because if we haven't taken that step, everything that we talked about here today, we're not going to understand. We're not going to be willing to do. Because it's when we give our life to Christ and say, here, everything I have, everything I am, it's yours. I know who you are. I believed you. I've given to you. I sacrificed to you of my time, of my talents, of my finances. These things that I hold so dear, I give them up and I surrender. They're all yours, God. When I do that and I enter and I receive his truth and I bring that into my life, I enter the waters of baptism. I go under my old self, living for self, dies. My new self comes up ready to step out in daring faith, to be generous in ways I never have before. Then I'm filled with the Holy Spirit to be able to take the steps that we've learned in these last nine weeks. And specifically, we've been reminded about today about what it means to be generous. So maybe, maybe the step you need to take today is to make that step. If you're struggling with giving of anything in any, in any kind of way, then maybe that's because you haven't honestly given your life to Christ the way that you need to. And maybe that's why he brought you here just to hear that. <laughs> to say, I want your heart. I want your life. And maybe that's a step you need to take. Or maybe you've taken that step and whatever worry, fear, all the things we talked about a little bit ago have come up and you've forgotten how to step out in daring faith to be generous with all that God's given you. And you need to recommit to that today. Maybe that's the step you need to take today. Or maybe you just want your family praying for you so you can know how to be more generous with everything God has blessed you. I don't know what it is, but we're going to spend a few moments in prayer. Let God's Holy Spirit speak to you of what that would be. And if there's a decision you want to make, if there's prayer you need in your life while we're singing this next song, come on up here. Come on up here. And we will celebrate life with you. Father, thanks. Thanks that you are such a generous, giving God. And you do love this world. And because of that, you gave. You gave you one and only son, Father God. Thank you for what that means to us in our life. Forgive us for the times we forget that. Forgive us when our faith, Father God, isn't there and we live a life by fear instead of faith. Forgive us when we we look at things and we try to reason them out and instead of stepping out in faith and revelation, realizing who you are, trusting in who you are, Heavenly Father. But thank you that we could gather the way that we have. Gather in the weeks. Thank that we could gather each and every Sunday that you, this day is set aside to come and to worship you, to give you the thanks and praise you so rightly deserve, to come and have your words speak to our hearts, to encourage us and challenge us. Thank you for all the opportunities you give us to remember and be reminded all the opportunities to give the way we need to, Heavenly Father. Thank you for loving us, and thank you that we have those promises that we can stand on, and you are a God that keeps those. Thank you for that. Thank you for what that means. Lord, may your Spirit speak to our hearts, a truth that we need for wherever we are in our life today. And when we hear that truth, Father God, may we have your wisdom and strength today to step up and to step out in faith, maybe in ways we never have before. Thanks, Father God. Just hear our hearts as we continue to praise you. It's in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Please stand as we sing.